Hello everyone, I'll continue the series on the Karo Khan with a very good variation for black as an alternative to the main line with bishop to f5 and that's the Korshnoi variation. Uh, it was named of course after Victor, Victor Korshnoi, the great Soviet player of the, I would say, second half of the 20th century. And it goes like this, uh, of course after e4, c6, the Karo Khan, d4, d5, uh, it starts after white plays knight to c3, which could once again enter the, either the main variation uh, the Karpov variation, the Korchny variation, or the Bronsteel Larsen variation, I will show you all of them. After d takes c4, knight takes c4, the main variation would be bishop to f5, after which white plays knight to g3, you play bishop to g6. Uh, the Karpov variation would be knight to d7, after which white plays knight to f3, you play knight g to f6. The Bronsteel Larsen variation would be knight to f6, knight takes f6, g takes f6. And uh, and the Korshne variation is from this same position where black takes with the e pawn, which is, which is far more solid, although it's taking away from the center. So e4, c6, d4, d5, knight to c3, white goes for the classical Karo Khan or the main line, d takes c4, knight takes c4, and now black doesn't go for bishop f5, which is the main move, but knight to f6. White is obliged to take, every other move is passive for, for, for white. Of course, uh, black's next move, if white doesn't take, will be knight b to d7, transposing to the Karpo variation with a, with, with a much better position, because black is even free to take, uh, take the knight. So, if, uh, if white should try defending, that, then knight to d7 would force white to take. So e takes f6 uh, after knight takes f6, and this is the start of the Korshne variation. Now, the problem with this line, uh, first of all, it's superior because it's uh, keeping black's king side solid and preparing to castle king side. Uh, secondly, it offers uh, quick development to black. Of course, you can see that white doesn't have a single piece developed. And the most common move for white in this position is c3, so uh, black is actually the first side to, to develop a piece. So black has great prospects uh, in development. And the second thing is that black's king is actually pretty safe after a move such as g6 and castling kingside, uh, the, the extra pawn on f6 actually provides a lot of defense. The major downside of this position is the deep pawn that white has. And if you remember normal Karo Khan positions, usually this pawn is here. And uh, when you have pawns on e6 and on c6, then d5 is pretty hard to play for white. And in this position, white will uh, create a passed pawn on the d file easily. Not easily, but much simpler than had the pawn been on e6. And uh, if he wants, if you if the pieces are off you if you imagine all the pieces of the board then a simple move such as c4 and d5 would create a passed pawn so black has to be careful about that long term this is the worst thing about the Korshne variation for for black by the way uh if you like the theory in the basics of the Karo Khan, i have made a video on the on the basic pr principles ideas and main variations for both sides i will link it to the in the description below and i have also made a video on the bronstein larsen variation with g takes f6 on move six for on move five for black and the carpo variation which is another good alternative so you can check them out as well if you are looking for something else in the Karokan. but let's focus on this now so c3 is the main move there are pretty much only two other moves that white could choose on move six and that's either bishop to c4 which is an okay move, it gives a lot of attacking, attacking chances to white, even though after a move such as bishop to e6, white is uh, almost obliged to exchange the bishop, straighten out black's pawn structure, and he doesn't have anything. So this is an okay move, but if black reacts correctly, black can easily equalize. Another move is knight to f3, but that is uh, that will happen anyway, and usually the, the, the line with c3 will transpose. So let's focus on c3. This is first of all solidifying the d5 pawn and uh, allowing moves such as bishop to d3 to make sure that the d4 pawn is defended, and it's also solidifying the entire central structure and highlighting the fact that white has better pawn structure. Now the main move for black in this position is to develop as quick and, as quick as possible and to castle. Uh, you do that by playing bishop to d6. This is your first move, the last move to, to castling, and you will be able to play rook to e8 check, most likely forcing white to block the check. Now white will react with bishop to d3. Once again, there are two more options, but bishop to d3 is by far the most played and the best move. You could try bishop to c4 uh, or bishop to e3. But bishop to d3 is supposed to be the best move, and I think it practically gives a lot of chances to white to develop as soon as possible. And another thing is that it's immediately striking at the h7 pawn, so uh, 
black is usually castles on move 7, so uh, having a bishop on e3 immediately attacks the main weakness in the position. So after bishop to d3, black castles, uh, and white immediately plays queen to c2. And now you can see that already black has some pressure on his position, but it's really nothing major. And uh, this is a threat, but it's easily resol resolved. First of all, black should play rook to e8. And this gains a tap on the king after knight to e2. You have two options. This is where the 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 Korchny variation of the Karo Khan branches out actually. Most of the moves so far, which is very rare for any variation of the Karo Khan, will be played in almost every single game. And this is now move, move 9, where black gets to deviate for the first time. Uh, every other deviation before this move would be bad for either side that, that tries it. So this is these are by far the best moves both sides could play. And if you remember your side. You have to you have to know how to punish if if the other side makes a mistake, but it's really not that clear. But just remember that that this is what you have to play. So from this position on, it's clear that your h7 pawn is falling. So you have two options: h h6 or g6. Now uh, there is a clear downside downside to playing g6, which is the main move. And if you remember uh, any positions with the kingside fianchetto. Uh, then first of all you know that usually the bishop is, is on g7 providing support and secondly you know that uh, the opposite side usually has a plan of pushing uh, the pawns on which the king is fianchettoed on which the bishop is fianchettoed and the king is castled because now h4 h5 are significantly more powerful because they have a target they can they can attack immediately and there's no way for black to prevent that so g6 provokes the move h4 which has to be played by white to prove an advantage and now your king is already castled, your king is already weakened, you have a ruined pawn structure, black has, a, uh, black has no attack at the moment, white has a clear plan of attack, but the position is still equal, and it doesn't mean that black is worse, black is actually uh, completely equal now. Now the way to react to this uh, is to play bishop to e6, starting to develop, and you will see how to react to these threats. Now h5 by white is the normal continuation, you play f5. You can see that the pawn is defended twice, the bishop is supporting that, and you have a clear plan of queen to f6, knight to d7, and supporting your king side. And white isn't that uh, quick to material on, on his attacking advantage. Now of course h, take g, h takes g6, f takes, and you play b and white plays bishop to h6 which is the most aggressive continuation but it has no targets here and getting the the queen to any dark squares is pretty hard because you have the dark squared bishop you have the knight which is coming to d7 and you have the queen which is coming to f6 so this looks promising for white but practically speaking uh, there is no progress to be made now we play queen to f6 immediately solidifying your king side structure a uh, white will generally castle uh, castle queen side of course because the rook is very active on the h on the h file and after knight to d7 well let's say knight to f4 you have to save your bishop i mean you don't have to but it's a smart idea because it's a great attacking weapon on this diagonal bishop to f7 and this is let's say the starting position of the korchne variation the great thing about this if you decide to play this with the black pieces is that you don't have to learn any sidelines this is what you will get in almost every game so remember this as an easy variation to learn if you are playing Karo Khan for the first time, and if you see that your opponent is a knight to c3 player, that he doesn't play the advance, the exchange, or the pano, or something else, uh, this line is a great weapon to, to memorize the theory in, because uh, if you play this, at move 20 you will be at least equal, and there is no way for, for white to get you out of your preparation without being worse. Now with experience come, come your killer senses which tell you when uh, the deviation from the theory has been a bad mistake by white, and you will have to learn that yourself. Now uh, the plan for white in this position is obvious, but the, black, the plan for black is obvious as well. Uh, white is going to play f3, g4, open up the position, and black is going to play b5, a5, b4, open up the position that way. And you can see that black's bishops are really active on the diagonals. The queen is ready to come into the attack as well. The rook is perfectly placed or placed on a8. And you have a plan of knight to b6 after you play b5. Or even before if you want to strike at the c4 square. So those are your general plans. I will show you the position uh, a bit further on. So f3 by white, knight to b6. Rook d to g1, supporting the, the g4 push, knight to d5. This is a great idea to exchange this very active knight. This is why knight to b6 can be played. Knight d5, bishop d5, and now tell me who's better here. I think that 
the position is equal, but uh, Black actually hasn't uh, started his attack yet, and so he has more potential, and White's attack has somewhat slowed down, and I don't see what White is doing. And Okay, White is by no means worse, I would just rather have Black in this position. I have a safer pawn structure, I have b5, b4 in the position, and after g4, I can even push f4 and stop uh, the advance of White's pawn, so I think Black's pos position is perfectly playable. Uh, after f3, uh, as I said, you don't have to uh, you don't have to play knight to b6. You can play b5, but just remember not to chase this knight away. And a move such as g5 would be pretty bad and almost losing, or in fact losing for for black after knight to e2, knight to b6. You can see that firstly this pawn is falling and your position is crumbling. So just remember uh, not to move your pawns after you get this structure, and you will get it almost every game after f5 and h4, h5, h takes f takes. So this is the position. Uh, now let's return to, to this line. After knight to e2, uh, to this position where the bishop and the, uh, and the queen are forming a battery on, age, on h7, uh, last time we played g6, so stopping the, the, the attack that way and provoking the moves h4, h5. The other option that you can play is h6, and now with this move you get a completely different game, and h6 of course uh, doesn't provoke the move h4 h5 because you imagined uh, if you imagine this move being on h5 it doesn't really do anything and white is going to have to play g4 g5 and you have three defenders on g5 you could even add uh, the fourth so h4 h5 is a plan that doesn't work after h6 so in that position white isn't going to castle queenside he's going to castle kingside so the next move by white is castles in 90 percent of the games now you play queen to c7 and now you provoke white white and now it's his turn to weaken himself once again h3 is a sensible move uh, g3 would firstly take away the square from the knight and weaken the king uh, unnecessarily. Now we play b6 and your plan is to, to get your bishop pair striking directly at the king and once again I ask you to, to think about who's better in this position. Of course uh, white has slightly better development, a slightly better pawn structure but after bishop to d2, bishop to b7 and c4 which would be the best idea for white to advance on the on the queen side, who's better in this position? Of course remember not to try and... Uh, c4 is designed to close down this bishop so if, if you play a move such as c5 then after d5 you are immediately losing so don't do that. But white most commonly won't play c4 because that is the most, uh, most active move and white will generally try something else but if he does remember to develop normally just play knight to d7 let's say rook, uh, rook i'm sorry uh, rook a to rook a to e1 you can try a5 you can expand on the queen side you can play rook to d8 you can play rook to e7 rook to e8 doubling on the e file and all of your pieces are optimally placed the bishop on b7 is yet to be activated and the knight is yet to find a safe square but uh, you can do that easily. You can try. You can try moves, as I said, such as doubling rooks. You can even try knight to f8, knight to e6, provoking the move such as d5, which would be great for you uh, if you don't play c5. And the plans are there are many plans for both sides, but uh, Black's position is perfectly playable. Let's go back to this uh, starting position. So after knight to c3. Uh, the Korshnoi variation starts after, after d4, knight takes c4, knight to f6 by black. And after white takes, you capture with the e pawn. So now, uh, once again, let's repeat what you have in this position. Remember that uh, your h7 pawn will be a target most often after c3, bishop to d3, queen to c2. They will be striking at the h pawn. You can defend it either by playing the move h6 or the move g6. The move h6... If you play h6, that's provoking the moves h4, h5, weakening... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, my phone is ringing. Sorry about that. Uh, so the move, I'm sorry, the move g6 provokes the moves h4, h5, and that would weaken your kingside structure. And the move h6 means that white is going to castle, uh, white is going to castle kingside, and not attack your 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 kingside structure. So if you play g6, white is castling queenside, attacking you with h4, h5. If you play h6, white is castling kingside and you will have the attack first with queen c7, uh, bishop to d6 and striking at h2. So these are some of the things you have to know. And generally in any endgame, uh, let's go back to the to this position, you can already see that if, if these bishops would get exchanged with these bishops, if the rooks get exchanged and the queens get exchange, exchanged, 
uh, then this pawn is much weaker than this pawn, as is this pawn. So this is the start of the game for white. And if the pieces get exchanged, white's main plan is to get the king uh, somewhere around here and to push the pawn. So this is what you have to look out for. Remember that in any endgame, white is practically better because of his pawn structure and the advanced deep pawn. And uh, while the game is going on, you have great chances for attack. So that's it. Uh, I hope you learned something, learned something from this video and that you got a new variation in the Karo Khan. The Korchno is a great way to fight uh, white and to avoid the main lines, which have a lot more theory. And uh, I hope you will use it. Thanks very much for watching. Stay tuned for more chess. Bye.